Good morning. Good morning. On this final Sunday of Advent, I have a little disclaimer as we open our service. This is probably the most un-Christmas message on the Sunday before Christmas that you will ever get. And here's why. Thursday morning, I had, you know, by Thursday morning, you know, I'm, I know where I'm headed. I know where, what God wants me to teach and what he wants me to preach. But Thursday morning, I'd, I had been studying the, during the week. My outline was done. I was like getting excited about the message. But Thursday morning, God really impressed upon me, that's not the message for this week. You'll get it next week. <laughs> But as I, as I sat in my office and just prayed and just read through scripture, God made it very clear that this Sunday is going to be a little bit of a different Sunday as far as a Advent Sunday. And I think there's a reason for that. The other week I was driving, um, I don't remember where I was, but it was evening and, and driving through a small town and the Christmas lights were just like everywhere and it was awesome. But as I was driving through that town, the reality kind of hit me. You know, a lot of times in this time of year, in this Christmas season, we see the lights and we see everything and it's all Christmassy, but inside it may not kind of feel that way. And I know for many that this Christmas just seems different. It just seems almost like it's a little bit off. And as I started thinking through this, you know, we may on the outside see everything that's just like reminding us of Christmas, but on the inside we may really be struggling. And our theme for Advent this year is joy. We may not feel it. We may be sitting there going, we're talking about joy, but it's just like, okay, joy. And so this morning... I have one goal. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. As I thought about just kind of life, the last 21 months have been different. Everything that we know stopped. Everything that we planned changed. We've lived in a world now for a while that just seems like always at odds over everything. It doesn't matter what it is anymore. And all those familiar things that we have enjoyed kind of changed. And we still kind of live in this, this kind of this fear of what's next. But here's the problem. In the midst of all this, if that wasn't enough, we still have the normal pains of life. Health issues, employment issues, losing those we love, dealing with the drama and trauma, whether it's at work or at home. We see weather storms affect our nation, our world. We see political storms that continue to rage. And I think for so long we've been trying our best just to hold it together. And we get up every morning, it's like, okay, one more day I can do this. And we put one step in front of the other. And I think for a long time, that's kind of how we've been living. Forcing a smile on our faces to try to give the appearance that everything is just fine. And that may be how you're feeling this morning. Burden weighed down, needing a little help, needing a little hope. Can I encourage you with something this morning? Take a minute to breathe. I feel like so many times we're walking through life and we're just under an incredible weight. This morning, I really want to encourage you. 
That is my goal. I want to encourage you, not because of anything that I say, but because of what we're going to look at in God's Word. And as we run the race of life, and it's like, how can we have joy in the journey? Because it's like, I'm tired, I'm beat, I'm exhausted. This morning, I pray that God's Word is a, is a cup of cold water as you're running. As you're feeling overwhelmed, as you're feeling exhausted, as you're feeling worn out. As we get ready to get into God's word this morning, I've invited one of our elders, Rob Moore, to come and pray for us this morning. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to come before the throne of grace, but we also want to remember those who are struggling. I know many of you have just watched what's been happening with the, the incredible storms down in the Kentucky area and just that whole area with the tornadoes and just the loss. And so as we, as we get ready to come before the throne of grace, one of the things that I've asked Rob to do is to make sure that we take a moment and pray for those. This Christmas is going to be different for them too. And so as we walk through today, I want us to be encouraged. I want us to be challenged by God's word. And so let's take a moment and let's go before the throne of grace. Rob. Good morning. Let's pray. Our gracious and heaven, heavenly Father, we do come before your throne of grace this morning. We come before your throne of grace knowing that prayer is a time to breathe. You know, scripture says, you know, why art thou cast down, O oh my soul? Well, maybe that soul didn't pray. Maybe that soul didn't reach out. So we're reaching out this morning. And we think of that word joy, unspeakable. But yet in reaching out to you, we have to realize that joy, Jesus, others, you, is speakable. We can speak about Jesus. We can certainly speak to you about others and ourselves. So we first come to speak about you, Jesus. We just thank you. We thank you for the gift that you are to us. This wonderful music we've heard this morning. Those folks that authored those, those songs, those lyrics under the direction of your spirit. And then to put the notes to it and the harmonies to it just uplifts our soul. Truly this morning, we've had soul music. Soul words. And now a time to pray from our souls. So we lift you up, Jesus, the one who has freed us, freed us from the punishment of sin, freed us from the power of sin, freed us from the penalty of sin, and through your spirit, allow us to practice our lives without sin. You've been crucified for us, and we need to crucify our sins. So we first deal with that, Lord, in our hearts to help us to invite that spirit in even now. Cleanse us so that our hearts and minds are right before you, before the message that Pastor Jeff's going to bring to us. And now we think of others. We think of that person in front of us in the pew, behind us, on either side. Help us take a moment to, to pray for that person. And now we think of our families as we will be gathering this holiday, this Christmas. There's folks that are going to be coming to our gatherings that maybe there's a, a need to reconcile differences. Maybe there's a need to encourage, to lift up. Maybe there's been death due to COVID. There's many in our church that have been affected and impacted by so much. And certainly the bell of COVID has rung a lot in our, our church. Help us to think of those. And yes, Lord, these folks in Kentucky, across the Midwest, that have had their, their lives completely wrecked. No home. No church. No car, all their paperwork is gone, no proof of insurance, all the photo albums are gone. 
records of finances, gone. It's all gone. The landscape's gone. The town they loved is gone. It's all gone. And yet, what an opportunity for God to show up through people, through the, the work of our convention, sending people in, funds in, resources in, to rebuild, to revive, to restore. And we can do our part here to be prayer warriors every day, appreciating all we have. We're so blessed, all that we have and they don't have is help us to have a tender heart for those around us who've had a tornado hit their lives. We see it literally in the Midwest, but the person next door may have had a tornado hit them. Not a cyclonic event of difference in air pressure and wind of 200, 300 miles an hour, but the tornado of depression, financial ruin, alcohol, drugs, Maybe they have been rejected. They've been hurt. They have no hope. They have no hope. And we know, Lord, hope is hard work. Hope's a hassle sometimes. It's heavy. And yet, we have it. We thank you for that gift we have. Some have more than others, but you have it. Because we have Jesus. Help us to give that to those folks. Help us to be aware of those around us. Even our neighbor, they may be the person sitting next to us this morning. Now, Lord, we pray for ourselves last. And Lord, I'm just going to take a, a, just a few seconds for each person in here to reflect upon themselves and to pray to you about ourselves. We thank you for this time, this time to breathe, this time to come to you, this time to deal with our soul, our innermost being, and what we can do to uplift others around us. I pray for Pastor Jeff. I just thank you for a pastor that can change the schedule of a week because your spirit impacts him. That it's not liturgy. It's not programmed. It's by your leading. I thank you for that. Give him power. Give him a presence here. Give him peace as he delivers this message. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at the first two verses of this chapter this morning. And uh, as we read these two verses, could we just stand together as we read God's word this morning? Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You may be seated. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christians. And there's a challenge that is given to them in this book to move and to grow in their spiritual maturity. Even though they are facing persecution at the time. The challenge is not to just maintain where they are, but that they move on in their walk with Christ. And as we get to chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, there's a theme that kind of comes through. It's a theme of athletics and also a theme of citizenship that kind of come together. And for the original audience hearing and reading this letter, this would have rung really true to them. Because they would, have, they would have instantly in their minds remembered the foot races that took place in the arena. The training that's involved. They remember seeing a race where someone grew tired and weary and dropped out. But they also remember those who persevered, who fought through the pain, finished the race, and won the prize. 
They also knew that to be a competitor in the race, one of the key things was that you had to be a citizen. Doing okay, Zeke? All right. Thanks, brother. And as we get into this passage of, of Romans 12 verses, or Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2, there's three things we're going to be looking at this morning. And I think it's three things that we need to remember. First thing that we see as we look at verse 1 is this, we see the encouragement. It starts out, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Therefore, kind of gives us the thing we have, we have to look back. What is Paul kind of, or not Paul, but whoever the author was, some say it was Paul, who is kind of summing up everything to this point. And as we look back in chapter 11, the chapter before, we see a chapter that we, it is referred to as the Hall of Faith, a chapter full of men and women who we would say that they are heroes of the faith. We see people like Abraham. God says, go, I'll show you where to stop. By faith, he takes off. Going to a land that he doesn't know. God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. He's like... We have no children. And we're kind of past that, that point of life. And guess what? As we, look at, as we look at Hebrews chapter 11, as we look at what God does through them, it says, Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. And as you read that chapter, you look at more and more of these incredible people who lived by faith. And then we get... To chapter 12 and to verse 1. Because of all this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this great cloud, it's an assembly or mass of people. This group from Hebrews chapter 11. This word witness comes from, we get our word martyr from the original word here. And as you look at Hebrews 11, especially towards the end, verses 36 and 37, you see that there are those who gave their life as a martyr and as you look at the ways that they were treated this great cloud of witnesses what does this great cloud of witnesses do and our first thought may be they they're in the stands as we're running going yeah you can do it that is not the case as we look at this great cloud of witnesses they provide the example of how we should run we look at their lives. They ran, they persevered, they never gave up. They give us the example that the race, how it can be run and that it, we can do it. That a godly life can be lived. That God is worth trusting and worth following. As one commentator said, they are the examples, not the onlookers. Their lives provide a testimony and a witness for us. They live to please the Father and, they, and their lives give us an example that we may do the same. Because our goal is not to please them. Our goal is not to please the heroes of the faith. Our goal should be just like the heroes of the faith in chapter 11. Their goal was to please God and God alone. We're not comparing ourselves to them or to see who's better but to do just as they did, to faithfully follow God. And their example provides encouragement. One of the things that I am not is a mechanic. I'm not. But that doesn't mean I don't try. <laughs> One of the things that has get, been an incredible encouragement to me when it comes to fixing things, because I'll always try first. I'm like, I'll try to fix it, and if I can't, then I'll call somebody. But I'll give it a shot first. But one of the things that has been an incredible encouragement to me when it comes to fixing things is videos on YouTube. Because I watch them and I see there's a guy who's done it. And he's showing me how to fix this problem. And I'm like, well, if he can do it, I can. He gives me an example. He provides the encouragement that I can fix what is broken. When it comes to encouragement, I think it's, there are many times, if we're really honest, we probably walk around pretty discouraged. We walk around pretty discouraged. Doing okay? Right. Box is kind of falling apart there. I'm going to hold underneath. There you go. There you go. A lot of times I think we, uh, we're a lot like Zeke. We're carrying around a lot. 
and we're feeling a little overwhelmed. It's getting a little heavy? A little. A little bit. It's getting a little heavy. And a lot of times, what's our response when the journey of life seems long, when the journey of life seems to be a struggle? We're taking my bricks away. We're helping you. Actually, I want to put them back in the box. Okay. Put them back in the box. But you can stay here, though. Okay. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, in that passage, burdens is referring to the weight of temptation and to spiritual failure, but there's a principle here that is that's still there, the burdens that we need to help one another bear. Since we have this incredible group of those who have gone before and provide us with the encouragement, sometimes we need to be reminded of this. That there are those who have run and they've completed. They've run and they've faced and they succeeded. Imagine. You can help him hold the box now. Yeah, I'm helping him. Does that, does that help, Zeke? Yes. <laughs> now imagine. You're running through life with your box of bricks. Things are weighing you down. You know what it's like when somebody comes alongside and kind of helps you with that burden? And you bear one another's burdens. Suddenly, encouragement is there. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another. You know, one of the things that Rob said in his prayer, I think is so true. We don't know what our neighbor may be facing. We don't know what the person beside you may be facing. One of the things that, that's how, it's like, well, how am I supposed to know? It comes down to relationship. I had somebody this week, Thursday morning to be exact, who sent me a message and said, hey, just want to let you know I'm praying for you. And they filled in the blank of what they knew that I needed prayer for. How'd they know that? Because of relationship. As we walk through life, we need to be a people who encourage one another. You say, well, how do we do that? How do we encourage one another? Well, number one, we have to know what's going on in each other's lives of how we can encourage one another. We need, we need that relationship. We need that fellowship. But also, do you realize how simple this can be? And I challenge you all to do this, and this is where it gets really interesting. Ask someone, how can I pray for you this week? And then do it. Give someone a call. Encourage them. Send somebody a text message. Use social media. Use it for good. Pray for and with people. Prayer is an awesome thing. It's kind of like when Zeke is struggling with his box of bricks. When suddenly someone comes alongside, there's an encouragement. Suddenly it's like, I can breathe. I, can, I know that I'm not in this alone. I think there's a lot of people who are walking through life. And they're like, I'm all alone. I'm carrying this burden and I just don't know what to do. And I just can barely put one foot in front of the other. We need to be a people. We need to be, as followers of Jesus, we encourage one another. May it be said of us, just as it was said in 1 Thessalonians, that we encourage and build each other up just as we are doing. To be honest, there are days where I carry a box of bricks around. And when someone comes alongside and says, let me help you. Do you know what that does for me? The encouragement, even a message says, hey, I'm praying for you. It just is like, I can breathe. I, can, I feel encouraged. I feel excited to continue to do what God has called me to do. Who is it that you can encourage? And you may say, I'm in need of some encouragement. I've kind of forgotten about those who've completed the race, who have run, who set an incredible example, and I need to be encouraged. We're going to have an opportunity at the end of our message today where if you're in need of encouragement, we're going to minister to you and encourage you. Because we're not going to go in with the mindset of life is perfect, there are no issues, there are no problems, and all is peachy. 
not the case. And so we need to be encouraging, we need to be ministering, and we need to be praying for one another. Thank you. Zeke said his workout for the day. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. Appreciate that. But not only do we have the encouragement from this passage, but we also have, we see the endurance. As we look at the second part of verse 1, it says, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Think of a runner. When it comes to Olympic time, we, we love the Olympics as a family. We love watching it, all right? Now, you've never seen like a, a race where the, you see everybody lined up and you see a guy come out, he's wearing a parka and snow pants. You'd be like, okay, maybe he's from somewhere cold, but he's really not ready to race. Why would he not do that? Because like that's going to slow him down. I've seen runners over the years and they will do incredible crazy things to give them the slightest bit of advantage. Why? Because they want to go faster and they want to remove anything possible that will slow them down. Endurance. It's a determination to keep, to keep going. The opposite is wanting to or actually quitting. It's being full of fear, laziness, apathy, or cowardice. It's lacking that endurance. And so one of the things that we see here is that we need to remove what slows us down. It says to lay aside every weight. Now here's what's really interesting is this may not necessarily be a bad thing. A coat in winter is great, but not when you want to win the race. What is it that is distracting or slowing us down? And the text doesn't give us any specifics as to what exactly is being talked about here. One of the things that some commentators believe what it could be happening is, is that these Jewish believers are kind of slipping back into the legalism of the Jewish belief system. And it's weighing them down and they're forgetting the fact that the law has been fulfilled in Christ. What are the weights that are slowing us down? Several years ago, my family had this incredible, really fun adventure. Most things with my family turn out to be an adventure. But one of the things that we were doing is we were going to Europe to visit my wife's parents. But then in the process, we were going to be like in three different countries at three different times. And I was coming back to the States to speak at a camp on the East Coast. My wife was going down to Italy. My kids were staying in Austria. It was just going to be really fun. We're like, this is crazy. This is our world. Well, one of the things that I had is, is as an illustration, because I carry my props with me everywhere I go, was I had these ankle weights that were going to be an object lesson for the very first first message that I was speaking at of in this camp. And so one of the things that I wanted to make sure was that I did not lose them because I'm like, if I'm traveling and I lose my weights, then I'm like, okay, how am I going to get them? Because I knew this camp was in the absolute middle of nowhere. So one of the things that I did in my, in my smart thinking was, okay, I'm not going to put them in my suitcase. I'm going to stick them in my carry-on. And it also kept the weight of my suitcase down. Great idea, right? Here's the problem. Security in Paris doesn't think that that's a good idea. My weights literally slowed me down. We were running late for our next flight anyway, and they're like, sir, we need to check your bag. My wife is like, I'm going to stop the plane, catch up when you can. But the weights that I had thought were a great thing, they were actually, they were a good thing, but they were slowing down my progress of being able to get on the plane. What are the weights the things in your life that are slowing you down, that are keeping you from running the race as God wants you to run. The things that are distracting. But not only that, it says to lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. While all sin is going to slow us down, the word that is used here is in the singular sense. It's very interesting. It doesn't say the sins, it says the sin. And as we look at this and we look at the context and the setting of what's going on, it's likely here that the sin that's being referred to is the sin of unbelief. It's doubt. Doubt and living in faith do not coexist together. If you're living in doubt, you're not living in faith. If you're living by faith, you're not living in doubt. What does sin do? It wraps around our feet and keeps us from being able to run. It's like having your feet tied up and still trying to run. And you're like, why can't I run? Because your feet are tangled up with sin. 
So not only as we, as we look at the endurance, not only do we, need, do we need to put aside the things that are slowing us down, but what is the sin that is wrapped around our feet that is slowing us down, that is keeping us from running the race? We're told that we're to run the race with endurance. And the thought of that, you might be like, oh, but Jeff, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm beat. What's slowing us down? Are we distracted by maybe even good things? Are we having our feet tied up with sin? Is that slowing us down? We need to run with faith, not run in doubt. How many times, and this is just being real with you, where we're, we're walking through life and we're like, I wonder if God is going to do this. Is he going to really take care of me? Is he really going to walk me through each step of the way? That's living with doubt. That's not living in faith. When you read Hebrews 11, and I encourage you to do that, you want to talk about people who lived by faith. What if this morning I said, okay, you're going to move somewhere, but I'm not going to tell you where. Go. It's like, is this a reality show or something new? It's like, that's what Abraham did by faith. He started out on a journey not knowing where he's going to end up. God says, you're going to be a great nation with no children. This is great. How is God going to do this? He lived by faith. And as we look through the, through the chapter of Hebrews 11, you see these people who walked by faith. They didn't walk in doubt. They walked by faith. And may that be us. Now, how are we to run? We've seen the example. We've seen the, the, the encouragement from, from those who have run before. We see that we need to run with endurance. And as we get to verse 2, we see that the ultimate example that we need to follow. Look at verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the, found, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of, of the throne of God. Here's what's really interesting. In salvation, we look to Jesus. We realize that he is the one that we must look to for salvation. As you think back to the, the book of Numbers, the Old Testament's an incredible. And as you notice one in Numbers, the, the Israelites at one point, they started to kind of murmur and bicker about what God was doing. And so God sent snakes which would have been the death of me anyway, just seeing one, but snakes that would bite them. And it says that many of the Israelites died. But then they realized that they needed to repent. And the people came to Moses and they said, we have sinned and we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. Now this is where it gets interesting. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and that everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So may, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if, the, if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is amazing. Imagine this. You're just getting bitten by a snake and these snakes will kill. But you see that Moses has set up a bronze serpent. And even though you're bitten and you're thinking, oh no, this is surely going to be in. You look at the, at the serpent that's on that pole and you live. What's really interesting is as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he uses this as an incredible illustration. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus says, this is kind of an example. And we understand this, that Jesus was lifted up and we look to him for salvation because he he is the only one who can save. In our moment of greatest need, we look to Jesus. And as we run, we must keep our focus on Jesus and nowhere else. Jesus is described here as the author and the perfecter of our faith. I love this. This word author carries an idea of like pioneer, kind of like the trailblazer, the one who's gone before. He's the one who shows the way. How were those in Hebrews 11 able to do what they were, were able to do? It's like they did incredible things. They're walking by faith because they followed the example of Jesus, the one who had gone before.
When I think about pioneers, my mind goes back as living in the Midwest for about 17 years, you learned a lot about the pioneers because that was an area that people traveled through and you would go to places and they would talk about the trail and where the, how they did this. And there's things that, you know, growing up on the East Coast, you don't even realize. Like the grass was four foot tall and there were no trees. If your kid ran away, you had two options. Try to find them while the wagon train moved on or leave your kid. The things we don't even think about. And yet, how were they able to know where to go? Because someone had gone ahead. Someone had blazed the trail of this is where you need to be. And as you, as you study the, the, the movement west, it's so interesting because they had it down to you had to reach this certain point by this certain day or else winter's going to catch you. And there are stories of those who ha didn't make those dates. They went ahead. Jesus is the author, the pioneer, the originator of our faith. He's the one who has gone before and while we may be amazed at the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, they are in no way comparable to Jesus. He is the chief leader, the chief example for us to follow. But not only is he the author, he's the perfecter. He is the one who carries it to completion. Imagine if, if I was a pioneer and I had, had started to blaze a trail, but I never finished the trail to where we were supposed to go. And I was going to give you instructions on how to, to get there. And you'd be like, have you made it all the way there? No. You'd be like, I'm not listening to you. We're going to get lost. We're going to, it's not going to be good. But Jesus is the one who has completed it. He is the perfecter of our faith. How did he do this? By shedding his blood. As you read on in Hebrews 12, looking at verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He shed his blood. He took your sins on himself, died for you. He is the one who completed it. He is the author and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. And I love this next part because we're going to get back into the little bit of the joy theme. And this is where it gets really interesting. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This joy, it's the reward at the end of the race for those who've won. What was Jesus' motivation? It was the joy that was set before him. You may say, well, what is this joy? If you read back in John 17, verse 4, as, as Jesus is talking to the Father, listen to what he says. He says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He did what the Father asked him to do. Verse 5 shows us his reward, to be glorified in the Father's presence. This joy that was set before him, this joy that said, I'm going to glorify, I'm going to bring glory to the Father. What did that joy lead him to do? He came to earth as a man, left the splendors of heaven, was born to a poor couple, born in a place where animals would shelter for the night, visited and worshipped by lowly shepherds, to live 30 years on earth, to begin a ministry with a bunch of ragtag group of guys who would desert him in his final moment of need. One would betray him and one would disown him. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured the cross, the pain the agony of having a crown of thorns driven into his head, his flesh ripped to shreds. And then after, if that wasn't enough, having his hands and feet pierced and driven to a cross. Despising the shame, crucifixion was a humiliating way to die. Not only are you in incredible pain and agony, but in crucifixion you're hanging naked on a cross. A shameful way to die. For the joy set before him. You're like, where's the joy? To do what the Father asked him to do. He says, I want to bring glory to the Father through my obedience. There was a joy of obedience. The joy of doing what the Father had asked him to do. 
What about us today? What's the joy that is set before us? And then maybe our first thought may be to, to be saying, well, that must be heaven. That's the joy set before us, arriving in the splendors of heaven. But here's the thing, even those who have placed their faith in Christ and choose not to run the race that God has set before them and to not really, to run with endurance, not to follow the example, not to be encouraged by those who have gone, by, gone ahead, they still receive heaven. But when we talk about the joy for us today, it's stated well by pastor and commentator John MacArthur, he says this, we run for the same prize that Jesus ran for, and we achieve it in the same way he did. We run for the joy of exaltation God promises will be ours if we glorify him on earth as the sun did. We glorify God for allowing his attributes to shine through us and by obeying his will in everything we do. How do we have joy in the journey? Because the journey may not be great. It may be painful. It may hurt. And you may feel like not only are you carrying a box of bricks, but you're getting hit by bricks. How do we have joy in that? Because of realizing why we're doing what we're doing. When life gets discouraging, it's like, well, nobody, nobody in my work even cares about Jesus whatsoever. I feel like the only one there. I praise God that you're the only one there. There's hope. You're a light in a dark world. The joy that is set before us gives us joy in the journey. Jesus, the ultimate example. The ultimate example. He's the one that we follow. We run with endurance. We don't quit. We don't stop. We don't give up. And we look at the encouragement of those who have gone, gone ahead, who have run the race, but also we need to be around each other being an encouragement to one another. As we close, it's going to look a little different. We're going to have our deacons kind of surround the sanctuary a little bit, and here's what we're going to do. You may say, Jeff, I am in incredible need of some encouragement. I look at the examples of those who have gone, but gone ahead, but I really could use somebody to come and to kind of help me and to be an encouragement to me. And our deacons are going to be praying with you and for you. And encouraging you. Maybe you say, I just need some, I haven't been enduring, I haven't been running the race. Haven't been living by faith that I know I need to be. Maybe when it comes to following the example, you have taken your eyes off Jesus. You know, they say that when you're running, if you look at your feet, you run slower. If you set your eyes on the goal, you'll run faster. Maybe this morning, as you've been carrying what feels like the weight of the world, and your head is down and you've taken your eyes off Jesus, what does verse 2 remind us? Looking to Jesus. That's how we got to live. That's how we got to run. And so this morning, maybe you say, you know what, I haven't been keeping my eyes on Jesus. I've become distracted. Maybe this morning you need to have a, a moment with Jesus and say, you know what? My eyes have, have not been on you. And you repent, make things right. Where are you looking as you run? I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up. And if our deacons would kind of move into place around the edge, I want to read a psalm that I think is incredibly encouraging and a reminder of who our God is. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy inhabitants, holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes war cease 
to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That's our God. That's our God. And I pray that as you think about who our God is, that that encourages you. As we sing, I want, to, I want to encourage you with something. So many times I think in church settings, we're like, well, if I move, what's everybody going to think? I'm your pastor and I need prayer. I'm thankful for guys around me who pray for me. If you need someone to encourage you to pray with you, maybe you say, I have gotten so off course and I need someone to, to guide me. That's what these guys are standing around the sanctuary for. We desire to help you. Let's not let shame keep us in our seats. If God is challenging you and you say, I could use some encouragement. I need a prayer to endure. I need to, to follow the example and I need someone to, to pray for me and to encourage me, to help me. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of that. Life gets heavy. Where do we go? Do we take the moment to be still and know that He is God?